All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Who's Your Band? Uh, Sean, how are you today, my friend? Uh, I'm, I'm wonderful. I'm talking with you, Jeff. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for you. Uh, I'm excited today. I don't know if you're excited. I'm in a great mood. I'm excited. I'm always in a good mood. Me too. I know I'm excited. We have two real interesting guests. You know, uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk to both these guys. Um, from Mars Day in the Time, Macy Gray, we have bass play. This guy plays... Andre, how many instruments do you play, by the way? Uh, you mean, like, competently or? <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> competently. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I don't know. People have different counts because keyboard instruments count as different things. So I, I, I guess uh, maybe five or six or seven, maybe eight, if depending on what we're counting. Jesus Christ. Well, anyway, that is Andre Holmes. <laughs> what? <laughs> and- what? Hello, and from Saturday Night Live and comedy clubs across America, not in 2020, but in any other year, <laughs> Mr. Dean Edwards. How are you, Dean? Peace, peace. I'm doing well, man. Uh, Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Guys, we really appreciate your time and coming out here. This is this is awesome. Uh, I'm excited to talk to, like I said, both of you guys. Um, I want to start talking to Andre uh, first. Um, Andre, uh, did you grow up in Minneapolis? No, I am actually born and raised in Louisiana. Oh, shit. Okay. Country oh. boy from, yeah, from down south, Monroe, Louisiana, actually, northeast part of the state, and um, and started my roots uh, playing music there. Um, historically Black uh, College is uh, Grambling State University, which is in oh, north Louisiana. Sure. And uh, so kind of cut my teeth there, going to their laboratory. Uh, magnet program school so I started as a little fourth grader and started playing trumpet and then everything just kind of spiraled out of control from there and it never stopped. Uh, trumpet a great intro instrument because of the fingering and the numbering correct? Uh, absolutely absolutely and and just there's a good theoretical base that comes with playing any horn instrument you have to kind of get your, uh, your your notes and your scales and things like that. And so you generally learn all 12 keys uh, pretty early on, and that will benefit you for the rest of your life if you want to play music. So you're growing up in Louisiana, and was there music in the house? Like, And who were your early influences? Did you, was your mom and dad into music, brothers and sisters? Yeah, yeah. It was something of a bit of a mix of all of that. Definitely a musical family. There was a piano in the house. So my first real instrument was probably banging around on a piano, right? Having no idea what I'm doing. Did you have an ear right away? Man, I'm not sure if I have an ear now. Uh, No, I don't. It's something that I've worked on. And honestly, like in all sincerity, it's something that I still work on. I envy those guys who have this weird thing that they can hear. Like my son is kind of is going in that direction uh i'm not sure how i don't know so uh, i i have a good ear I've, i was always naturally inclined to it but i worked real hard for it you know what i'm saying i worked hard for it but you're so a professional it, musician you're a yes and you and you you still practice you have to practice every day to be good yeah yes yeah i learned yeah, i learned I, how to play two songs on the piano when i was growing up i took like four years of piano lessons i learned how to play home sweet home by motley crew and right here waiting by richard marks so when i would try to impress a girl they're like oh play me a song and i start playing home sweet home they go play me another song i start playing richard marks they go play me another song i'm like bitch you're out of luck that's the only two i know thank you sir you too may be a professional musician you can do it exactly. all you gotta do is <laughs> you just gotta know a couple of things and then and the rest is fluff oh <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> what was the early music you used to listen to? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, my first big influence as far as music that changed my life um, was was Prince. But I was always into a lot of music. I loved classical music as a kid. Um, I loved jazz. So my mom bought me like some George Benson cassette tapes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, which were sweet. I loved Ozzy Osbourne and Kiss. Uh, as a little boy, and then Megadeth became one of my favorite bands. Still is one of my favorite bands. Of just, I love Dave Mustaine. I love Megadeth. I don't care what anyone thinks about it. I love it. Um, but then Prince changed my life. When I saw Prince and saw him on stage, actually I heard him first, and it blew my mind. The sound that was happening blew my mind. 
What it was, was my first older Prince song? What was the song that got you into him? Thieves in the Temple it was the first song I ever oh, heard by Prince. Oh, wow. This is good later, song. later Prince. Yeah, this is later. This oh, is wow. later that I got into Prince. And it was like I was uh, standing outside of my oldest brother's bedroom. He was listening to Thieves in the Temple. I remember standing outside of the door where he couldn't see me, but I could hear. And after the song was over, I literally walked into his room and said, what was that? He's like, dude, that's Prince. You don't know Prince? And I was like, no. And he just he, he just kind of gave me a short education. And then uh, shortly after that, who would have known? I was in Prince's house hanging out and like on tour with one of his bands. Uh, yeah, it's a trippy thing. But that was the moment. And that was the song off of Graffiti Bridge. Uh, changed my life. Great really? song. That's amazing. Dude, Prince and, is one of the only artists that I can honestly say uh influenced me just on different levels like not only just music but i even got a tattoo i got the prince logo tattoo there you oh, wow. go wow. my wow. man that's like, what uh, i'm talking about yeah and it just not even because of the music i got the logo because you know when he when he went through the whole contract dispute and he changed yeah. his name to that that was just a big fuck you to everybody like he's like look i'm gonna put music out and now i'm this this symbol so i yeah. i got that because kind of like with comedy i don't want anybody to tell me what to do so yeah. it's, it's kind of like I look down and I just, I keep true. That's why I got Oh, it. man. Oh, that is so powerful. Thank you for being a part of that family and the familyhood. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Yes. Ding, did you like Prince? Any, uh, any I have a t- tattoo of Prince. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would have been dope if I did. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great if we all had tattoos of Prince, right? No. Like, the roof. They're more the roof. Of us. Yeah. It's like the three three of us have Prince tattoos. Jeff pulls out a fucking air supply tattoo. <laughs> hey, I had tickets for air supply until this fucking pandemic. I know you did. <laughs> now, nah, man, yeah. I um I love I we, you know who doesn't love Prince? I uh I remember my cousin, she my older cousin, she was into Prince, and I think the first record I remember hearing from Prince probably was Controversy. Yes. Um, That's the first big hit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I remember he, it, it's funny, I thinking back, I don't know if I knew he was a was a man when I first heard that song. He sang very high back then. It, I, you know, all the thing people say and, and so you you heard it and you were like, I I don't know what it is, but I like it. It's doing something <laughs> to me, you know. And, and then, then you saw uh, the album cover, and it just still didn't answer the question. Right, right. <laughs> I, I didn't know what ambiguous was back then, but right, I that's what right, that right, right, yes. And, and then, and, uh, but then she, she, I mean, she was obviously she was older, so she was on Prince before everybody else, before he, even even before 1999. And then I remember, I think 1999 was the first video that I saw of him. And it, you know, this is when MTV first really was popping in in New York. We had a video music box. No, no, actually, uh, New York Hot Tracks. Wait, wait, was video, video music Ooh. box DJ Ralph McDaniels? Yes, yes, it still yes. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Video he's music still around. Box. He's still, yeah. He's still. Uh, they actually just did a um, uh, COVID relief um, thing about a month ago. Because he, he, you know, he has, from what I understand, he has a basement full of tapes of all of our favorites um in hip-hop from way back when so he has this catalog man i mean he's he's you know priceless gem but um with with prince it, it was uh it was it was just you knew you saw something special you just didn't know what it was and i think i he think was cool he was cool yeah right from the get-go, yeah right? because like, because he he had he had that swagger you know he had a the- swagger and so did the rest of the band like for me it yeah. was the little red corvette video and yeah, I, yeah. I like that little breakaway, like when he does, you know, when, when he, he does, does the dance, dance, he does the yeah. spin and does the split. Yeah. And, yeah. But then you remember, the, he had a guy in the band, the guy with the Japanese headband. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Love that Jesse guy. Jesse something? Des Dickerson. That's Des Dickerson. That's, that's yeah. Des okay. Dickerson. Des, yeah. That was Des. Yeah. That was Brother Des, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 He ahead. did have the, the Japanese the Japanese bandana, like and Daniel Sun. And he was just cool, and he was playing a little bit on, and he had a, a, a couple of lines on uh, the 1999 song. Remember, life right. is just a party, right? Remember? Yeah, oh, yeah. That please line. don't That's sing. Right. <laughs> Jesus Christ! But when I woke up this morning, could have sworn it <laughs> was <laughs> Judgment <laughs> Day. Yeah, <laughs> that is. <laughs> that was that guy was great. Now you got what was it like hanging out with Prince? Holy smoke! 
uh holy smoke dude is right uh like holy smoke honestly literally it was like being around holy smoke um it you know surreal surreal uh but he was so funny and he was just a regular guy the times i got to really hang out with him were really i consider special times because it would be with uh, the band at the time, you know, generally, um, either after a show that we had done or a performance that he had done when we we're in town. Um, and generally private parties, so not a lot of people. And it's kind of Prince doing his thing. Um, I just have really wonderful memories of him. I mean, uh, he liked to watch, like if they, let's see, there was a performance earlier that day that he had done. Well, that evening, you would be in Prince's company and watching the video of the performance that he had just done. Oh, wow. And he'd be walking around on couches with his remote control because, you know, he's not a big guy. And he did walk around on the couches. He, like, would walk across the room via the couches. And he would be, like, with the remote and just, like, watching himself. And it kind of it showed me something. It was like, oh, okay, so it is okay to watch your performances. <laughs> like, right. you know, sure. you're not being weirdly vain. Like, if Prince is doing it, I'm like, okay, well, this must be a thing. And, um, yeah, it just always good food, music, and, uh, man, just just in awe. Yeah, he, okay. they, he, uh, he put out an album, like, in 2014 with the Third Eyed Girl. Yeah, yeah. And they were playing Third, yeah. City Winery. And, you know, yeah. there's this big rumor like, oh, you know, Prince is going to show up. I'm like, I'm, I'm not driving to the city at like 1130 at night, man. It was like on a Tuesday. <laughs> shit. And uh, yeah, he uh, they played for like a half an hour. Like he threw them off the stage, played like three hours at City Winery at a place that holds like 150 people. Yes. Yeah, I pretty much I want to punch myself in the dick for that one. Which, really. which City Winery? Where are you exactly? Uh, well, I'm in you? Jersey. I'm, I'm right outside the Holland Tunnel. So. Yeah. OK. All right. So OK. Ten minutes away from me. So you're saying laziness as a comic uh, held you back. What a shock, honey. Right, right. What a shock. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we have some common threads in the, you know what, I've always had, I have friends who are, good friends who are comedians. I respect the craft. I really do. Everyone thinks they're funny. Everyone thinks they can be a comedian. And un, but until you get close enough to the real craft and you're like, no. No, you can't. And you may not want to, you know, it's that's it. So I have nothing but the utmost respect, but we do have some, um, some, some of the lines definitely, uh, they parallel and maybe cross up there. So yeah, I, I that always makes say me that good. musicians yeah. want to be comics and comics want to yeah. be musicians. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And actors want to be musicians and musicians and people want to be actors. It's, it's one of those things, but we're all artists. And the, the artists, cool thing is right. we all live on that art umbrella and so right. when you're when you're creating and you're creative you know you 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 almost think that there's nothing that you can't do and that's a good thing that's the reason we can fucking do some of the things that we can do because we didn't put that break on ourselves you know now yeah. then you get to a, a point where it's like well talent takes over or you know the skill comes in and and some got it and some ain't got it right so you know well you look at you look at um, so many artists that transition from music to in front of the camera or, or sure. Lady Gaga um, comes from, to mind. Or behind the camera. Yeah. yeah Gaga uh, or Jamie Foxx. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. You know, uh, um, I, I was going to say uh, Trent Reznor is scoring films, you know, so we, like you said, uh, Andre, we're all artists. And I think, I think what, um, what pushes us is not having those limitations because I think everybody um, on the Zoom right now, at some point, somebody told each of us, are you sure you want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you said you've been playing, playing various instruments since you were a kid. So that's part of your trajectory. Um, and at some point, you became an outlier because you put so many hours into that. So it's not, it's not unlikely that you would pursue music and find some level of success. It may not be the success that people want because I think people that have never done what we do um, see it and they're like, oh, well, you're only a success if I see you in a video or in rotation on the radio constantly, whereas we all are working artists, right? We're all working performers that have found a way to earn a living 
being creative. And so from that, from hearing no from so many people and finding success um, as, as a musician, it's not, it's not un, unheard of for you to at some point say, you know what, I, I, I'm funny to my friends. I'm not telling you to do this, but I'm funny to my friends. I'm going to at least get on stage because I have, I, I've been on stage, so I know how to command an audience, and I'm gonna I'm gonna see what this comedy is about. Or as a, as a, as a comic, um, not that not me, but other other comics that are musicians, saying, you know what, I wanted to go play this open mic where where they let people play guitars, go go down to Groove on West Third and McDougal on mm -hmm. Monday night for the open mic. You know, it's, it's it's I think it's a natural progression. I definitely felt that uh, when I, I went into comedy, I felt much more at ease because right. I was in a band for eight years before that. Okay. So, you know, now, so why? I, why? Why would you say you felt um, more at ease just because you just because I mean working? just stage presence? You know, because okay. I, I was the lead singer, so stage presence. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, knowing your way of walking around, things like that, talking to the crowd in between, stuff like that. But right. uh, I know people who you know, it took a long time for them to get their stage presence. And I felt like that was, I know the material came a lot later. I really did, right. but the stage presence right. was there. I mean, I, I, and the com the level of comfortable was just there from the first night. Right. Well, that's you know? amazing to me because I hear that and I feel comfortable on stage. I got over being uncomfortable with people looking at you pretty much at an early age. I think playing in right. church as a kid, you know, right. playing music. Right. You know, you, you had two live performances, Wednesday and Sunday, each week. Uh, and it just kind of was a good training ground. Right. But when you said the material came later, I'm like, wow. Because that would be my fear as to exactly what you were saying. Like, I, not that I'm compelled to do this, but in my mind, I would love to like, like maybe try to come up with five minutes, like a, not a tight five, but just, just a loose five and, and like try to get out there. I don't think I'd have a problem getting on stage, but when the material, if the material started to fail me, I don't know, I don't have the skill set or the, the, the thing. And so that's amazing that you were able to do it and then the material came later. Because I think for me in my mind, without the material, I, I have nothing to say. You, but you, you know, like you know, ability right off the bat, though. That's yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. you even if the material doesn't, because because I'd say probably seventy five percent of comics the first time they get on stage, they they don't do well. But something something makes them say, "I want to get back on stage and figure out how." figure out that 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 math equation right mm -hmm. and because you're already a performer what would carry you through like jeff said you have a likability and you already have stage presence and you Absolutely. know with with any performance is about connecting with the audience and fear and the audience senses that uncertainty so if you're yeah. on stage and cowering which i'm sure you wouldn't be just because you've already lived a life on stage even if it bombs you've been in you've done enough shows and enough hole in the wall clubs before you got with with Morris Day in the time to yeah. know how to pivot how to make that adjustment because it's really it's really a dance it's like boxing you know and, and so you figure it out uh, that's beautiful that's beautiful start. say again where did you get your start? I started, man, in uh, in upstate, upstate. I, I'm from I'm from the Bronx originally, um, but we moved a bunch of times. Uh, and I was in college. Um, sh sh also, I want to quick shout out to Andre because I played trumpet for six years too. So I, mm. so I, so I feel your pain when when, yes, when when you're seven years old and carrying that big <laughs> that big leather case. And you have school books. There's and nothing. You gotta get on. Did you take the bus? Did you take like now, we walked? I had to walk. I had to walk with with my bags, my 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 backpack, and that that uh heavy brass trumpet man. And and, yes, and so I know I know your your pain. And um, I started. That, that struggle man, is real. The struggle is real out here. So I salute any uh any any creatives that find their way on stage as a career. Um, I was always like a creative kid playing, you know, playing, like I said, I played the trumpet and, and I was a kid that- Were you funny? Cause you're one of the, were you always funny? Did you know you're funny? Did your friends tell you were funny? Were you voted funniest kid in school? I 
I, I was I was pretty funny, and my my gift was I I knew how to uh, I knew I was a mimic, so I I would get laughs just from mimicking everyone from uh, you know from Bugs Bunny to Eddie Murphy, you mm -hmm. know, and and over time, like I, I remember watching Delirious when I was what thirteen years old, and running it watching it on v VHS all weekend, and by Monday coming into school was like, you know, and, and mimicking at least 10 minutes of his set. And then two weeks later, knowing the whole set verbatim down to his breasts, right? And so that's when I decided that's what I want to do because I saw power in it. And um, fast forward to uh, my, my uh, I, I say it was uh, 92, February. It was actually a week before Def Comedy Jam premiered. I, um, I was in the play Fences at my school and we were having a, uh, Rehearsals were running late, and in the meantime, my, my college was also having Apollo night that that Friday. That. It was a uh, I went to Monroe Community College and Rochester Institute of Technology, and uh, at MCC um, they had Apollo night because Showtime at the Apollo was a big deal at the time. Mm -hmm. I think Sinbad might have been the host at the time, mm -hmm. and um, I went and wound up just they were rehearsing, so I wound up on stage snapping and, and roasting. And a friend, Kiki, she was like, you should, you should get in the show. And it was only two days later. So I had 48 hours to just cram. So I took all my books, all my joke books for the last nine, 10 years, which are really just homework uh, notepads that I never did the homework in, but I had, you know, mad jokes in. And I wound up coming in second place in that contest. That's uh, great. Uh, Dude, we have a very similar story. Oh, really? My, really? Fir my first time on stage was a comedy competition. Oh, wow. And I had been, I had been in my band for so long. And like, you know, when, and you guys all know when you're, when you're creative and you have that, that just that different kind of mindset that people have when you're not doing something creative, you start getting nuts. Yeah. And I was driving past my house. And I saw this big billboard that said uh, comedy competition. Yeah. And I wrote the number down. I called the guy. He's like, Oh, you have five minutes. I go, yeah, I got five minutes. Of course I got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never written a joke in my life. <laughs> So I literally just, I picked two topics and I did my five and there was 250 people yeah. at this show for my first time on stage. And there was 25 <laughs> comics and I came in second place. Dude, dude, dude. And then I thought, I thought yeah. every show was like that. I thought every single show was like that. So right at the show, this guy uh, who was like an old producer at the Laugh Factory in New York when they were open, he's like, oh, yeah, who was it? Who was it? Uh, Joe Lozner. Okay, I probably by sight. He does the yeah. Middle Lands comedy. Uh, yeah, he's he's okay. a horrible human being, but uh, <laughs> gives me his card. He he's listens like, to the show, show, by the way, Sean. What's that? He listens to the <laughs> show. By <laughs> the way. Well, then he um, knows he's horrible. I'm whatever, sorry. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, Andre Holmes said it, not me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, you, you're 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 in Alabama, okay? Yeah, Joe Rogan's yeah. not going to Alabama. Yeah, because me and Andre look alike. <laughs> And uh, my next show is for three people in Sea Caucus. So I was like, that was like a real <laughs> yeah. mind-blowing thing. Man. So you learn show cool. business early. You learn that it's, uh, you could be here and then suddenly a week later you're oh, there. Yeah. That's an important lesson in oh, yeah. entertainment. I've gone from going to doing an ice cream shop on a Sunday <laughs> for three for thirteen people, and then doing the Borgata the next night for a thousand right, people. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the sick. It's no, the no sickest, business. stupidest, most disgusting business in the world. And I wouldn't. I can't wait to get back. Speaking right, of show yeah. business, let's go to Andre yeah. for a second. Andre, how do you make the leap from growing up, going to school in Louisiana, and then getting in Mars Day and the time? Again, not knowing better, not knowing that it was something that there was a process. I didn't know that there was a network of people that you should have had and established. I didn't know any of that. So um, I was a big fan of the time. And when they would come to town, I would, uh, or in, to my region, rather, it, near Louisiana, within 200 miles or so like i was at a show i was at the show and i just Unlike developed Sean the relationship who wouldn't go you know 25 miles <laughs> seven seven minutes. minutes to go see prince <laughs> i mean uh, uh what can i say you hey you said it not me but um so yeah just being that guy and i guess it kind of manifested into i 
what I always tell young people is like, you know, and, and I've had that question before. How did you how did you end up playing with these bands or whatever? I really don't know legendary what to say. Band. Legendary, legendary band. A legendary band. A couple of legendary was... bands, because Fishbone was the other band. Fishbone That's was right. my yeah. Fishbone. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, right. So, I mean, but it really is the same process for me, at least. It was just kind of showing up and being there, being in the place, being a guy who was who uh, just was always there. And so I tell people, be that guy. You know, it's kind of like if you wanted to be on at the comedy club, even if you weren't on, you're there, you're studying, you're doing your craft, and it just takes that one night where someone doesn't show up. And, like, the booker, the promoter looks around, and he's like, what the fuck, what are we going to do? I mean, do, do you have five minutes? It's like, yes. And if you get up there and you kill, because you're kind of honed and you're studying that craft and you're just hungry, if you're just waiting there, scraps will fall. If you just stay at the edge of the table, uh, I think someone will pay attention to you. And that's how it was for me. I just kept showing up, tenacity. I didn't care how embarrassing it was. I, I was embarrassed to tell my wife that I was going out to shows that I wasn't playing on. You know, And I moved oh, wow. to Los Angeles to be a musician. And she's like, but you're not on the show. Yeah, but I'm going to the show because the musicians who are doing what I want to do are there doing it. So I just want to have there. no ego or a huge ego to survive in this business. Yeah, right. Man. And, and so it, whatever it is, either way, you know, you got to embrace what you got and uh, you just gotta, you just gotta go for it, man. I just went for it. Nobody told me I couldn't. So I just, I just tried everything so I you're could. Showing up that Andre, you're showing up at these shows. Yeah. How do you how do you go from being a fan at the shows to actually being in the band and performing on stage? That's insane. Yeah, you learn the music <laughs> just like you learned Eddie Murphy. Did you have to right? audition? Did you have to audition? audition? No, I never had to audition, which is a beautiful thing. I never auditioned for Fishbone. I didn't audition for Morris Day wow. in the time, and I did not wow. audition for Macy Gray. Um I may have had a, an, an audition-ish for Macy Gray, but not with Macy. It was with her musical director and the bass player. And we got together and we played music and it was just like, okay, great, dude. Like, okay, let's go. Um, I, uh, was it just a jam session? Like, like yeah, yeah just, he just wanted to, or he or she wanted to just what rock out with you and, and it was a vibe? Yeah, well, by that time, yes. Uh, my name had was out there with Macy Gray. My, I had been established for, for a while, and um, she needed a, a person, first of all, who could play trumpet and guitar. Oh, so wow. that wow. thinned out the herd right there. That thins the herd. And then they called um, a great um, promoter in L.A., and he gave them my name. They reached out to me. I met with the musical director, and then oh, we were flying off to Germany. You that's know? amazing. Why do, Dean, that's how, did you, how did you go from being a kid, you know, doing this like open mic show to getting on Saturday Night Live. And you were on there for a couple of seasons. Yeah, um, pretty much the same, man. Just just once once you once you sort of found the passion that you were you were in it, I think all of us when we first start, you're just happy to be a, amongst the other weirdos, right? <laughs> you know, yes. so, so, so find so your I, clan. You find your clan, man, and once once mm -hmm. you find, I, I, I my my uh, eldest daughter just graduated from high school, and, uh, hey, and she's an animator. Thanks, and and I just I told her I said, you know, now, you know, you you're gonna have your friends from high school that that you remain friends with, but now you really get to find your clan, find the other people that would go and veg out for hours in a corner of the room, right? And so that's what I did. Once, once I, uh, once I really started. Once I moved back to, I moved back to New York. Actually, wait, what's today? Twenty fifth. Today, dude, I moved back to the Bronx. Right? I told you, I was born in the Bronx. I moved back to the Bronx twenty five years ago today. Wow. On 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 uh, June twenty fifth, nineteen ninety five, I moved back to the Bronx, and then I was I engrossed myself in it, and I was I was out of every club especially in the 90s man because you had you had the mainstream clubs and then you had the 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 rooms and then you had the urban rooms so i would i would go when i finally got a, a telemarketing job i would wake up um at you know 6 6 30 
get to work by nine, take the tra get to the train by 7.30, make it to Brooklyn by 8.30, work from nine to five. And then I would carry my, carry my backpack. I had whatever hot, like D'Angelo was, was my, my temp agency album, right? Because <laughs> the dude I mentioned earlier, DJ Logic, he used to, he used to just get albums um, that weren't hot yet. And so that was, that's why I mm. love D'Angelo to this day, because he was up, kind of, we both were on the same journey. And um, I, would, I would take the train to multiple spots every night, get home probably at like 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning and do it all again the next day because I was just happy to be around everybody. So by the time SNL came around- um, They come looking they, for you or did you pursue them? No, nah, you know, they saw me at a, at a showcase. They saw me at a, a Stand Up New York on West 78th. Um, I, I, I actually, earlier that day, I had, um, I had auditioned for Mad TV and crushed it. And, um, and the story goes, I, I auditioned for Mad TV had such a great um, audition. They gave me a call back as soon as I left for the next day with producers. Um, and so that night that I had a stand-up showcase, I was feeling good. So I had a great set. Went back from Mad TV the next day. It went well. And then two weeks later, my agent called and said, Mad TV is, they don't even want to screen test you. They want, they're offering you six episodes that can roll to 12. And, and he said there was good news and better news. I said, well, what's the better news? He said, well, the people from SNL were in the audience that night. Um, Do you remember so who? Now, uh, I believe it was Ayala Cohen. Um, I, I always, is it Ayala or Ayana? I think it was Ayana Cohen. Ayana Cohen um, from, from SNL, from one of the uh, talent uh, people. And was, was Marcy the other one? And I don't, Marcy wasn't there. Okay. Um, but then Marcy was one of the people that what, when I, when I got hired, when I went to meet, um, Lauren after the, after the screen test, she was one of the people, her, Tina Fey, Mike Shoemaker, and, um, Lauren never tells you you're hired. He just, for me, for me, he said, good, we'll see you here. And, uh, <laughs> and then I left, left the office and Marcy's like, ha, ha. I was like, yeah, nice. She's like, so I was like, I. I said, I don't know. She's like, I said, am I hired? She's like, yes. I said, oh, because he didn't say anything. I didn't, you know, and, and then uh, and then my first day of work was actually supposed to be uh, September 11, 2001. Wowzers, oh, the oh. So go figure, you know. Yeah. You, were, you were known for your impressions on the show. But here's something I think a lot of uh, people who don't know this about Dean Edwards, you were in the military, right? The uh, yeah, it was National in the Army. Guard? Okay, I was in the army, army. army. And, yeah, didn't, army was a... and didn't didn't you kind of like do impressions of your drill sergeant? Well, I used to I used to mock, especially in, in boot camp, man. I used to mock my drills. I still tell myself I'm a write write a uh, movie about boot camp because it's such a such an exciting experience that so many people have gone through. And uh, yeah, drill sergeant Lanier, all right, private, get your dick in the dirt, private. <laughs> you know it was, and and. That yeah. was, you know, that was how I, I, I would get in trouble. Sounds like for, a football coach at, at LSU. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, uh, the only way I got in trouble when I was in, uh, in boot camp, and then I learned, I looked like, we had a platoon of 60, and 30 of them were from Puerto Rico, and then there were probably about 10 white dudes and 20 black dudes, and... I looked like two other brothers that were about six <laughs> four in the BDUs and had the uh, the the uh, uh, the birth control lenses glasses because I wore glasses back then, so I learned how to just blend in. <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want to do any extra push up there. <laughs> now the name of the our show here is called Who's Your Band, and now you're from the Bronx originally, yeah. and your band is a Long Island group called yeah. Andre. Public Enemy, you know Public Enemy. I, I've I've heard of them. Yeah, uh, little little non controversial uh, rap group from the eighties and nineties. Oh, yeah, okay, no, okay, thanks. Okay, now we're on the same page. Gotcha. Yeah. In my opinion, <laughs> yeah, back me up here. <laughs> I'm trying to be cool, guys. Oh, oh no, you're great. You're great. You're am I great. doing? I'm, 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 I'm trying. I'm down. I'm I'm with it. You, you, uh, are you, you down are with OPP, Jeff? You are channeling 
I'm getting early Kurt Loader MTV. <laughs> oh my God. Oh God. <laughs> Shut up, oh, Andre. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're enjoying this way too much. You're, you're becoming Sean Morton's favorite new I, 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 I had no I idea. I, no. <laughs> I knew I was going to love this because I knew I would just be laughing at you guys the whole time because I'm just a freaking, I'm a, I'm a gesture's favorite participant. Like, I will laugh at anything. So, guys, have at it. I, I don't, you know. Uh, no, but I love yes, You do. <laughs> when, when it comes to Public Enemy, in my opinion, Back me up, best rapper ever, Chuck D. Yes, no. Yeah, Chuck, yeah. Chuck, I, you know what? I don't like giving anybody the best, like, like as right. much as I love because he was so uh, passionate. I, he but, but connected with his words, man. Like to me, what he was, you know, whatever topic, whether I agreed with him, not agree with him, mm -hmm. you knew he was real. You knew he was authentic. You know, he was, a, he was an original, or is he still is? He still, he still is, is an yes. original. Yes, yes, yes. My shirt, man. I'm, Rage. He's oh, okay. It is. Rage. Yeah. Combination of yeah, both man. groups. Yeah. With Vice, I hold the mic device. <laughs> that was a great record. Um, yeah, I think I think Public Enemy, I think a lot of hip hop groups back then all were uh individuals and, and they everybody had their own style. That's what I loved about what they consider the golden era of hip hop was that public enemy didn't sound like run DMC. And right. EPMD didn't sound like Stetsasonic, and and MC Light was totally different than Queen Latifah. Everybody, yeah. everybody stood stood in their own in in stark contrast to um, the current era of hip hop, where everyone has the same thing. Me a lot. Everybody has sort of a same similar cadence and the style. Same yeah. thing. Got it. Same thing. Same thing. Got it. Got it. it. It's like right. really? That's right. not okay. Right. Talent. Right, where's Talent. where's pup with with Chuck D? <laughs> when when Chuck you know, Ch Chuck's rhymes were like de declarative, like no matter what the name, we're all the same pieces in what big chess game, and then contrast. He meant it. He meant yeah, that man. shit. He wasn't posing. He wasn't staying right. just to right. to panda the people. Whether right. he, he didn't give a shit if you agreed with him, didn't right. agree with him. He meant that stuff. Like think about songs like "Don't Believe the Hype." Yes. Uh, Yes. Bring the noise. Yeah, Can't yeah. trust it. By the yeah. time I get to Arizona, yeah. you know those yeah. were songs, man. They, you know, he wasn't talking about bullshit either. He was real. And you, and so you what, know what? What? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. You know what? No, no. If you think about it, Public Enemy songs were not were not party records. Like, um, mm. you know, it was social you, commentary it, before they yeah. allowed it to be called social commentary. Right. It was angry right. black gangster right. rap or whatever right. the labels that they right. were putting on it other artists were able to do some of the same things had been doing it for decades and it was called social commentary right and when it came in a certain package for a while there it wasn't given that same that same uh kind of cultural or, or whatever that moniker of right. like oh this is a certain person's point of view from their reality and we can gain from, we can glean from it it wasn't right. viewed that way at, at the beginning right. anyways i'm sorry because well, they, they were they were young black men and, and, and exactly well that's what i was a, trying I mean, to avoid saying the the, the the beauty i say well i mean even his logo which is actually very current now a, a, a black male in the crosshairs of of a uh, of a uh, semi-automatic weapon you know I, I thought that everything that that um Public Enemy and Chuck D did sort of there. There was a method to their madness, from from their logo to to the to the the name and the font that they used to uh, Chuck D's you know hard heavy voice contrasting with with Flavor Flav's lighthearted yeah boy you know it was it was and then the S one W's in the background scaring with 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 Uzis you know marching yeah, yeah. In, in formation. Uh, um, you know, they, it, to me, it was always amazing that you would go to their concerts and you would you'd see these suburban white kids with their soccer moms. <laughs> it was hilarious. I saw them me. open for the Beasties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I remember that. I, remember that. See, I, I grew up but, as like a rock metal dude, you know. Yeah, the, there we are, the, you and me. Right of there. the MTV generation. Uh, you know? uh, so when you're coming home from school, 
What was the y- first thing y- that was yo on? Yo MTV like, Raps. Yo MTV Raps. Yo MTV Raps. But yes. I, would always, I would always know, like, I would listen to Public Enemy. And, like, I had yes. a Black Planet. I had all the records. And, right. you know, I would say to myself, this is, there's something here. Like, even right. at a young age, I knew that there was a difference. Because I'm listening to that, and then I'm listening to Funky Cole Medina. And right. they're both considered rap. And right. I'm like... <laughs> nah, the same. This ain't the same. Right. It's totally totally the same. Right. Yeah, a little bit. You know who bit. should get? You know who should get credit for? I think blending the two is a guy like Rick Rubin. Because yeah. remember, well, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, and he came in, and I love that you brought him up because from the producer aspect, I really love that guy. I mean, to to do, and even to this day, like when you listen to him talk about the legacy of the work that he's done. He's only talking about the craft and the music. And that to me is like, that dude sees so far ahead, which is the reason he was able to produce yeah. the Chili and Peppers and the Beastie Boys. I, I mean, and, and so there, I, there, I'm glad you said that because a lot of credit has to be paid to that brother who brought to a Russell, lot of credit. And to Russell Simmons. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. well that's, yep, that's a yeah, whole other that's, thing. That's, but, that's, that's the pairing. Def Jam Def that Jam. allowed a group yeah. like Run DMC to go on. And now you think of, right. of Rick Rubin and the blending of the two. Remember the song yeah. Rock Block? Or Rock, Rock Box? Yeah. yeah. You think of Rock. Yeah. Yeah. But Rock Box was a heavy metal with rap. Oh. And that was Rick Rubin. And that record yeah. still holds up to this day. That Doesn't Rock Box. Big. Yo, Rock Box is, is, is the, the, the eighth grade trip to D.C. I remember first hearing that, man. And everybody, we were on the bus, and we were like, yo, what is that? And it just played on loop. Because I, I think that, that what was beautiful about music um, back in the days was, you know, I think all of us, you know, grew up with, with a variety, right? It wasn't so packaged because, you right. know, I, I love the Doobie Brothers and Christopher Cross. Um, just as much as I loved uh, folk, Funkadelic and Cool in the Gang and Michael Jackson and Prince, you know, so that you, as you had variety. Music, as long as it's good, we're going to listen to it. Listen, in 1985, music, yeah. I was about four foot ten and about 210 pounds. I'm nine years old wearing a fucking <laughs> red jacket and a white glove thinking I was the white Michael Jackson. <laughs> I think it was a lot to myself growing up. I swear to Christ. I can remember when Fight the Power came you out. Were right? like, you were like Corey Feldman then uh, at the time. Well, we sure. I should be so lucky, right? I can remember when Fight the Power came out, right? And I'm listening to the way he's like, Elvis was a hero to most people. Fact, Corey to me. Feldman. And that was great. I, I totally stepped on that, but we'll get back to that. And, the, you know, so I'm, I'm watching right. the videos, like, and so here I, I mean, like, I have fucking Metallica t-shirts and Skid Row t-shirts, and I'm all right. into this shit, and I'm, I am can't stop playing Fight the Power on a cassette mm-hmm. single, when they right. had wow. cassette singles the back cassette then. single, yeah, yeah. So I'm in my, and I'm, I'm walking through the mall, right, and I'm like, <laughs> Chuck D wore that, so I bought the fucking African emblem. Yeah. With, the red, with, with the red, black, and green, and I'm walking around with it. Get the green, black, and red in. Oh my god! And I had a friend in school. He was very nice. He was very nice. He goes, probably shouldn't wear that. Oh no, dude! Probably shouldn't wear that. No, dude. Rip. I'm just Rip, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's hysterical. Learn <laughs> culture. Learn oh culture, yeah, because that's what you look. Like. Dude, I had glasses and a fucking mullet. Dude, 13. I wish, oh guys, I wish there was a picture you Glasses, guys could like mu- put in, edit in right now. Glasses, a mullet, and an African medallion. I look like a very confused lesbian picture. girl. I really yeah, do. Hey. Find that picture. Yes. Find that picture. Somewhere that's your album never cover. See it. You will never <laughs> see it. You were ahead of your time. That's all I'm going to say, brother. It's all I'm saying is embrace it. You can bring it back. You may bring it back. I don't know. That photo right there? Shit. Might happen. You know? Hey, Andre, right. Andre, Yo. speaking of great producers, do you ever, you know, working with that whole crew out there, do you ever get a chance to work with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis? You know, uh, I, huh, I had a, here's my lazy moment. I had an opportunity when Jimmy and Terry moved from Minneapolis, they closed down flight time there and moved it, the operation to uh, Los Angeles. Okay. I, yep, I was working as a tech for the time at the time. 
Um, so, and that maybe kind of goes back as a throwback to your earlier question, how did you get in there? I mean, I did get initially hired as the tech for the band um, because I was on, the, on tour with Fishbone and I was playing, I was a member of Fishbone, but also going out with Morris Day in the time as a tech. And a lot of people on both camps asked me, why, what, what are you doing? Like you're in that band, why are you taking for us? And I was just like, dude, if I can just be close to this music, that's all that it, it means to me. Um, so Jimmy and Terry, uh, you know, of course, original members of the time, they got fired famously by Prince, moved on. Jerome, uh, who is Terry Lewis's brother, was no. still in the time. He, so the Jerome, they look Lewis exactly and Jerome, the same. Yeah. Jerome they, that's their brothers. Wow. They're brothers. Okay. So Terry Lewis and Jerome Benton are brothers. And so when they were moving, of course, I'm touring with, uh, I'm on the road with Jerome. And Jerome was like, dude, you should go down. My brother is moving into his new studio. You should just go down there and help them move equipment in. And honestly, I was young and I kind of was, you know, feeling myself at the time. And it was so stupid. I didn't, I didn't go. I didn't go to Jimmy Jam and Terry with wow. Jerome. Jerome said, go down they, they, like, and help them just move. And anyways, I didn't. And I still look back on that like 15 years later. And I'm like, what was wrong with me? But recovery, um, since then, I joined the band, obviously, clearly at some point you joined the band. Prince did the musicology tour. And the guy who played keyboards in the time who played Jimmy Jam's part, uh, he, Prince hired him to go on the road with him for the big musicology tour. So what we call it going up to the big house. Chance got called up to the big house. Like Prince called him, right? He, 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 Prince created the time, loves the time, loves Morris. It was just really wonderful to have him around. But then when he wanted to do this big thing, he handpicked Chance. So there was an absence in the time. And I was that kid just like Dean, you, you memorized uh, Eddie Murphy and after two weeks you could do it down to the breaths. Yeah. Well, it was that, it's that thing, we're cut from the same piece of cloth. Yeah. Because even though I was teching with the band, I knew all the parts. Not only did I know the parts, the keyboard parts, I knew the bass parts, I knew the guitar parts. I knew how to play them. I would practice them. I wasn't paid to learn that. I just wanted to make that music. And so when uh, cut two, when Chance went away, they needed a keyboard player. And one day in sound check, they were trying to figure out a part. They had hired a guy in. He didn't know his parts. He didn't study. So I kind of went over to Morris. I said, uh, brother, I know that part that they're trying to work out. Do you want me to go show it to him? Walked over to him. He said, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go. So I walked over and I showed him the part. By the time we got back to the hotel, I got back to my room. The manager called my, my hotel phone rings. And I'm like, what the fuck? Who's calling me? Answer it. It's the manager who is Morris's brother. And he said, well, congratulations. You made it. You're in the band. And it was, it was just like that. So maybe that was my audition. I didn't really audition. Uh, but, you know, so that's kind of how I got into the band. I digress. I forgot what the fuck I was, what the point <laughs> of all of that was. And hey, we're going to put you on the spot here for a second, Andre. It was a good story. It was a good it was story. A yeah, you know, story. Yeah, you think the question gives a shit? You, we give a shit about the fucking question? You just said you walked in and you, and you joined Morris Day in the fucking time. <laughs> Can we give a shit about the question we were asking before? Amen. Hey, right. oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right, right, listen to this. Um, Andre, you have one of the best quotes I've seen. I, and this is something, I mean, I really wish more people would kind of like take the heart. This is what he wrote. He wrote, a good human, a good father, a good friend, a deep thinker. Oh yeah, and a pretty badass musician uh, to boot. That sums you up, man. That is a beautiful quote. That is the- Holy that is, shit, can, someone read that? Someone read I it! I read that. Someone I think- <laughs> I no, love that quote. Thanks, Jeff. Because you know what? It shows the depth of a human being that you are. You know, I really think that's a really nice quote. And you know, you know, Jeez. in this world now, we're so quick to criticize and jump and, and cancel people, but we, but we, but we never want to praise someone, someone who has a great mm -hmm. outlook, someone who's positive and who is real about it. And again, 
that's that's what that's what that comes across to me. Cheers. 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 Okay. Let's get back to making fun of you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you got to do you were like, whoa, holy shit. All right, thank let's you. Talk, let's and talk about how you were a nerd <laughs> walking around with your trumpet case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's real. Listen. That's real. And and when Dean was talking about walking around with that KC, I had to take Grambling University, Grambling State University is about 35 minutes away from my home of Monroe, Louisiana. So I played trumpet and I also played French horn. And brother, mm -hmm. when you, the French horn, a double horn, it's a big, wonking, yeah. weird case. And to try to get on that bus, yeah. and like I was such a nerd and a skinny little kid and people, I was bumping knees and people hated me. It was such a struggle to take my French horn home and practice. That <laughs> it was just like, man, if, if this doesn't turn into something, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> You know, it's funny when you just said that, you just sounded like your teenage self. It became so hard to get it out. Here's a known fact about the French horn a serious fact about the French horn. Uh, there's been no Thank French horn did. player in the history of the world who has ever gotten pussy. Well, he, 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 he played bass. Look, no, but you played bass. Can you ima too. imagine how your life would be? If you only played the French horn, like you're walking down the street, no girl is ever going to give you a second look. You walk around with a guitar case or a bass case, you're like, Ooh, he's a bad boy. Yeah, he's a bad boy. You walk around with a French horn, it's like, this guy's got fucking scoliosis. <laughs> and the trippy part is, I can teach anyone a chord or two on a guitar in about five to ten minutes. Right. And and make you think, and someone else could think, oh wow, you're playing the guitar. It takes I don't know how much time to produce a sound out of the French horn, especially and, and, and let alone a good sound. So that's really interesting that you know. Okay, I think I, I think you're. I don't think you ever have to worry about anyone saying, "Hey man, can you teach me how to play that French horn?" <laughs> can you see how much you want that's one of the problems with the world today, man. We need more well, French horn players. Need, yes. Did you, let me ask Andre, did you play, yes, sir. Um, because it's because of HBCU, did you play in the marching band? Did oh, yes. Out, did it halftime shows? Because I had to Oh, crazy. yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So, so and, you Dude, know, I Grand love for the French horn player. Because because the marching band, yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. For, thank you for some recovery yeah. there. Yeah. You see, guys. The French horn has its place. There's a marching yes. French horn. Yes. And although in marching band, I did play trumpet. So, okay. um, but, but, you know, that's a, I know I just shot myself in the foot. I, 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 should, I should say, say less, Padre, say less. <laughs> <laughs> you, you gave me an out and I totally like I, closed I the door and you I, tried, I, damn it. I, I, I threw the alley oop and you threw it back. <laughs> <laughs> Like when you when you're in march when you're in marching band though right like like if you're carrying a tuba like that yeah. like you need to have strength and you need to have lung capacity like do you hate the fat kid who's behind with just the bass drum just banging the fucking drum <laughs> just do you hate that son of a bitch you mean the the person who's playing bass drum yeah yeah but they usually give that to a certain person yeah if we, you know we what know. I mean yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, you know, there's everyone auditions. They have different instruments. You get sectioned, and then then there's there's cymbals and there's bass drum left over. Yeah, I know. And I played, I played right certain... field too. So you said, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just like hold them, hold them, hit them now, hold them. What kind of child did you now? have, Sean? <laughs> what kind what? of child? <laughs> I you were a great fat boy with a Feldman. mullet. You played right field. I had a great childhood, horn. man. I pretended to be Michael Jackson. I pretended to be Chuck D. I was How a fat little alive? lesbian at 13. <laughs> I, and I wore a stonewashed jeans. It was great. It was a great life. And you look at you now. You're look interviewing. Look at me now. Look at me now. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an unemployed comic with fucking rosacea, and I'm 43. This is great. Uh, and a oh, lot of me. a lot of refrigerator magnets. Oh, fuck you, uh, uh, There we go. Oh, two weeks in a row this has been Wait. brought up. Yeah. What's wrong with refrigerator magnets? Oh, I see them in the background. <laughs> That's Wait. a lot. 
Boy, okay. Rich, Rich, Rich Voss was on two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Except, I know. And he starts he starts going into this whole thing like my daughter wanted to go to the store and all she wanted was a refrigerator magnet and the store was sold out. And I'm not even realizing that this motherfucker is ripping on me. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. Did you give him suggestions of other places to go to buy a refrigerator magnet? Oh, I told him I told him a few things he can do, believe me. But listen, that's an that's an amazing because during this whole quarantine. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have gotten into looking at people's backgrounds and you have probably the nicest kitchen for a working comic that's not a Whitney Cummings or, or you Thank know, you. A, a trillion year comic. No, because most people, everybody on TV has the fireplace. To me, that's the symbol sure. that everyone goes to. Hey, let me show my fireplace. I um. I, I'm like, let me show that I read. So I put the bookcase, <laughs> uh, the bookshelves behind me. I'm, um, I'm clearly homeless. Yeah, I was just going to say, Andre is homeless. And you're in a out. laundromat right now. So, so I, I live right outside of this laundromat right behind me. <laughs> but the manager said this is fine for me to do this out here. So we're good. That's <laughs> great. Dean, you're a, you're a great impressionist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Has anybody ever gotten upset about any impressions you've done? I, you know what? Uh, well, shoot, uh, Trace, Tracy wasn't happy when he found out I was doing him around what we were on the show together. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> you got a little disappointed. Time. You got a little, well, you know what? I, I think, and I just had this conversation with Elon Gold, who does a, a bunch of great, great impressions. Um, and sometimes people misread, you know, they say it's the most sincere form of flattery. Flattery, sometimes, right. Sometimes people misread it as you're making fun of them. And so when Tracy came, he was like, yeah, you know, why are you doing me? You do, do, do Denzel Washington, do Michael Jackson, do Eddie Murphy. Why are you doing me? I'm not, I'm not celebrity. Jimmy Fallon is celebrity. You know, and, uh, and so I, I stopped doing it um, for a second, but I was like, nah, you are a celebrity. So, I, and, yeah. so now he's, he's one of my favorite impressions. But I mean, that yeah. was, that was back when we were on SNL together. And now Tracy's, you know, is, is an even bigger star. So I, there was a point where I was like, man, whatever, I'm gonna do what I do. Um, and then Jay-Z, um, he actually, I was supposed to do this movie, uh, Death of a Dynasty. Um, Damon Dash was directing and had written the film and, he wanted me to play because because he knew I'd do a really, really strong Jay-Z, um, you know, impression. Right. <laughs> and so um, but I was, you know, like 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 Andre just said, with with uh, with regards to flight time, I was I was feeling myself. So when he asked me to do it, I was like, man, I got I, I just had a baby. We going to, sh you know, going to England this summer. I ain't shooting no movie. Um, but I didn't know that they were going to be the musical guests. Um, that weekend, or not that weekend, that that year, right around Halloween, the weekend that Jam Master J uh, was was murdered um, in New York, Jay Z was a musical guest, and Beyonce um, was was doing her duet, uh, "03 3 Bonnie and Clyde." And so I'm I'm in, walking towards um, the studio during during the taping, and uh, Dame Jess is like, "Yo, Jay, remember that dude?" Remember that dude I said, I called you when you were in France and I said, this dude does you? Yo, Dean, come here and do Jay, do, do Jay for Jay. And it's awkward because yeah. it's like, it's Jay-Z here, yeah. Beyonce, yeah. Dame Dash, Jay-Z's uh, partner, Tata, and me. Nobody ever wants to hear an impression of themselves because to them, they don't, they don't hear you. They don't hear themselves the way they hear, um, the way we hear it, right? right. So. Right. Right. So me doing Jay Z is how we hear Jay Z, but Jay Z hears himself from inside his head, mm -hmm. and uh, and so it was just weird. He's like, "Do it." So I was like, "Hey, yo, it's real incredible, yo, pay." And and he just looked at me. He's like, "Yeah, cool." And they walked <laughs> away, and I just, you know, just <laughs> yeah, it was pitiful. Hey, who was a good host to work with? Bernie Mac. Uh, Queen oh, Latifah, nice. Matt Damon, Reese nice. Witherspoon. Uh, um, um, like my top five um, hosts, I would say Bernie Mac, Reese Witherspoon was was the first host because um, it was like that was when uh, uh, Giuliani and the Firemen were on cool. stage with us. She, she, she was she was hella cool. Yeah, nah, she was a pain in the neck. Nah, 
we, me, me and uh, Ryan uh, Philippi, you know, we went out to dinner, um, a couple of cast members, they chose a couple of cast members to hang out. And we just had dinner with each other that Tuesday night of the week of the show. And she was just, you know, nobody comes to SNL really arrogantly because it's, 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 an, it's an experience unlike any other show in Hollywood because most TV shows, most film, you shoot it and it gets edited. This, this is your flying mm -hmm. without a net and it's, it's mm -hmm. literally live. So they're kind of on their best behavior. And nah, Reese, Reese was real. And this is also, this is before she was, she, she was one name. Like you can say Reese and people know Witherspoon, but this was like right, right around uh, uh, Legally Blonde, really Legally popping. Blonde, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Alicia Keys is a musical guest. So was, you know, everybody was, was new and excited. Yeah. What about um, worst host? Anyone in real pain? The worst host? Time? You won't get that out of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no one listens you know to what? this anyway, so you can tell yeah. us. <laughs> no, they, they, I mean, there they, they were there were guests that if if you go back, if if for any 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 viewers, if you go and look to see who was the guest host when NBC got hit with Anthrax, then. You you'll get an idea of, and it wasn't even that they were they were bad people. It's just they they made it about them, and they were all nervous to come. And I remember, uh, I think um, Amy Poehler says something that was so funny. She was like, "Oh yeah, because they're really trying that the terrorists are really trying to get you, you know." <laughs> because and we were all like, "Yeah, nobody cares about." about I hope somebody's googling that factoid yeah, right yeah. now. Somebody's <laughs> googling that. Someone, trust me, by I'm sure somebody will. By, by one day after we air this thing, people will be yeah. back to us. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Right on. You also been doing a bunch of acting, Dean, right? Uh, Spider-Man 3? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I have a, a bit part of Spider-Man 3, Sopranos. Um, I've done a couple of films that I was... Which episode uh, was... of the Sopranos? We've had a bunch Sopranos, of... Sopranos. Uh, oh, you know what? Uh, the uh, It's called, shoot, uh, Junior. It's when, when Uncle Junior um, was losing it, when he was going crazy. Jeff, and... it, it was on six years. It was the one episode with the one black guy on it. Yeah, right. No, no. You, his was funny. Mike Epps was also on an episode. Was he really? Yeah. yeah. If you if you go back and, and uh, it was just a weird i'll never forget because he was he was playing a, a gay character and the camera cuts him and he was like oh my christ and i'll never forget that line I still, I still, yeah. he's <laughs> one of those few people man who makes me laugh without yeah. doing anything mike epps yeah man mike epps is, is a funny dude man i've known mike for 20 some years and and mike is is just a pure comedian you know like yes like, he's he's a comic comics was just you're, you're leaving because you're tired and then epps walks in and you're like right, i'm gonna just watch because you know mike's gonna say something ridiculous on stage <clears throat> stupid yeah. question for both of you if you've seen them which is your favorite friday movie friday next friday or friday after next oh boy you know, you know what's funny can i say i've never watched friday sit, sat down and watched it from front to i've seen the movie but I've never watched it consecutively. I, I don't like the first it. one. I think the last one is the funniest one because it's more really? stylistic and funny. Which is the one with with uh, with Cat Williams? Is that the last uh, one. next Friday? Friday. Course, that's next. the third one. Yeah, I like yeah. I like that one, man. I like I like Cat. I love the scene where he uh he has uh, Terry Crews testicles in a vice yes. grip. <laughs> yeah. Um, I loved I love what Mike did with that character. I love uh, I, I, I loved a uh, uh, pops. I loved a. Uh, uh, John Witherspoon. Oh, Witherspoon, I think, I, yes. I, I think Spoon was a comedic genius that people don't yes. people don't give credit. Credit is due. <laughs> exactly. That's the piece. That's the piece. You're wow. yes. I'm correct with that. Yeah, Pops is dope, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I like both movies. I like all the movies. I don't know. I can't say. And uh, you know, yeah. So, yep. Go ahead. <laughs> and I'll tell you one one thing. I did watch this weekend, and I'll, Jeff, I don't know if you saw it either. Uh, it's been out for a little while. Uh, the Kevin Hart. Uh, series on Netflix. Don't fuck this up. Oh, oh, oh the five part, the like docu series. Can right? I tell you, man? Like, it, it takes good. a lot for me to like feel an inspiration uh -huh. about yeah. something. Like I know what we gotta do. Like we gotta sit down. Yeah, we gotta sorry, write guys. a joke. Work on the tempo. I I actually got up and was like. I'm writing a fucking movie. Like I was, I was. It really pumped me up, man. And he was brutally honest in that show too. Yeah, no, Kev, Kev was. He, he's uh from the. You know, real talk. Kevin, and I actually auditioned for SNL at the same time. Wow. I actually helped him. I helped him prepare his uh his audition. And known him. We've been friends for for many years. And then 
the whole the whole uh the whole hustle, hustle hard mentality man and he uh you know he's he just he focuses man once he has has something uh yeah. you know on his mind it, to do he just gets crazy done. crazy drive on him yes what, yes yeah it does dean were you happy on snl i was I, I was for my first year and a half my my, my the last half of my second year was was a challenge because i was constantly on the bubble not sure if i was gonna get renewed and like being renewed for a couple of weeks and then on the bubble you know so that which is a mental game that 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 they play but now i was man i i was i, I was hella happy i you know to this day i never understand when what people are um moping about it because you know people like um how'd you what about lauren michaels i heard he's i'm like oh man dude dude gave me an opportunity when nobody else did and and in the history of this that show's been on what 40 as it 46 years, years. Yeah, 47 years 47 years um no 45 they started in 75 right 75 45, 40, yeah, 75 40, or 76 yeah yeah, yeah, so um, so this is season forty six, I think. Uh, they just finished. Yeah, so um, no, it's there've only been what a hundred and fifty some odd cast members, and in that hundred and fifty, there've only been about nineteen people of my hue that look like me. So I'm I'm in a good number, man. I I I had a blast, man, because it was always we we we've been in those clubs, um, working for French fries and chicken wings, right? So. Sure. So speaking of chicken wings, Joe Lozen once paid me in chicken wings. Yes, I, I don't. I don't <laughs> doubt it. I don't doubt it. Um, no, so I, I had a blast, man. Joe okay. Lozen. <laughs> I like to give a big shout out to my buddy Andre here, who was standing out in a wind tunnel for the last fucking hour and five minutes. And when we're just starting to wrap up, he decides to go inside the house and sit in the couch. So we can actually hear him. <laughs> because uh, could you not? Could you? Was it no, really bad okay. audio? Yeah, we, we oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, wait, now you we know find what? out what it sound like. Yeah, it's right. It's the humidity. It's the humidity. Yeah, it's, it's like bad. it's so hot. I had to come into the AC. So uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but I was gonna say real quick though. Um, you were talking about Mike Epps just being like one of those funny guys, not to just yeah. make whatever, but he's one of the few people I've hung around. Um, mm -hmm. He and Jamie Foxx, like, just hung around them, not yeah. when they're on in a very right. casual setting, where just to listen to them talk and try to just tell you a story, you were laughing. Everyone's yeah. laughing. And it's like, yeah. whoa, dude, that's a whole different it, it was a whole different level. And then talk about Spoon. I have one awesome Spoon story. Mr. John Witherspoon, rest his soul, uh, hanging out in the valley in L.A. Um, at a place called Cafe Cordiel. And it's a great little music venue, restaurant. And I saw John Witherspoon one night, and he's hanging out with two, maybe I shouldn't say this, but what? two gorgeous yeah. women and i'm just like look at pops over there he's coordinated for real yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he was he was he was getting ready to bang 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 <laughs> <laughs> so absolute legend yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great this was a good episode was, guys yeah man yeah i laughed more on this episode than i did on the last 19 that we've done <laughs> I don't know if that's the truth, but oh, it really is. Rich They're getting better every week, man. They're getting better who, every who, week. Who was Rich Voss's band? What was his favorite band? Uh, I, I really thing. couldn't oh. give you a band because I, I, you know, I work so much and I'm such a good comic. Um, but he talked about like a Springsteen story. Uh, that's, really that's, that's so hack. He went with Springsteen. Uh, you know, a New Jersey comic talking about Springsteen. You know what I mean? Ugh. We had, uh, yeah, he was on with Carol Montgomery, so they were both Springsteen fans. So we did a Springsteen okay. episode. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good save. But, good but save. this was this was good, man. This was this. Was, we, I mean, we, listen, we were a little all over the place, but uh, it, it flowed. It had a good flow to it. It was, you know, it, it was, was organic. You gotta go organic. Sometimes you gotta say fuck the script, Jeff. Who was that supposed to be, Dean? That was supposed to be Jamie Fox. <laughs> 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 I thought it was kind of more like Tracy Morgan with a list. <laughs> no, I, was being funny, I thought it was, it was, I thought it was his brother was John joke, Fox. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> Dean, oh. we were supposed to do a show tonight together. I know. You know, it's funny. I have in my calendar. Is I, I looked at it earlier uh, 
today and I said, it's funny that we didn't have this show. Look, it's a, uh, I don't know if y'all can see that. It might be too, but no, Jeffrey Paul show. And then it, it went from radio interview to gig in New Jersey. So, yeah. I, so, Hey, you know, we, this, this was a good replacement. You next know. year, man. Next year, yeah, man. hopefully yeah. the world will be a better place and we'll be able exactly. to be uh, doing some more shows. Exactly. Guys, yeah. Well, whenever I'm you. in your neck of the woods, any of you guys, you guys hit me up. And uh, yeah. once we get back on the road, like you guys are, you, you will, we'll do it. Like, for Listen, real. Oh, don't that, tempt uh, me. I will jump on stage and fucking dance like a fat white boy. You, jungle you will be doing the bird. Idea. You will be doing the bird. Yeah, but yeah, unless it's no too idea. late, Andre, because you know, Sean, if it's after 10 o'clock, He's not going out. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. I'll give you a two week notice. I'll give you but a two week advance. See you. No, okay, but uh, listen, good. guys, we really appreciate your time. You guys yeah, are really guys. tremendous. Oh, you know, thanks, um, thank you. Stay well, be good, you and too, uh, uh, hopefully, better times ahead, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. 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 Looking forward. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, Adam, thank cheers. you very much for producing the show. We appreciate Good it. Show. Sean, parting words? Um, <laughs> I really want to do my Tracy Morgan impression for do fucking Dean Edwards, but I'm not do doing it. it. No, I can't. Edwards. You got to do it. Let's do it. You're in front I'm of Tracy Edwards. I'm going to get you That's about okay. it. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I just showed how I just showed how white I was. All right, we gotta wrap okay. it up with that. It, it, it matched it matched the the black medallion. Yeah. That's right. Oh, That's right. Suck. I can almost see it. I can almost see it. I hate all of you. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. So much. All right, Sean. cheers, guys. We'll see, see you, you next time. Bye. Later days. Later days.